Pastor already mentioned that today is Palm Sunday. This is the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem humbly. Zechariah 9 says he was humble, mounted on a donkey, not on a war horse, but on a donkey. And some say because that was the, the colt of, of a donkey that would have been so small that his feet could have dragged the ground if he didn't hold his feet up. So that would have been a humbling sight to see Jesus enter Jerusalem on that, that small donkey. But he also entered as the embodiment of salvation. Zechariah also says he was righteous and having salvation. Interesting way of saying he is the salvation. This marks the beginning of what we call Passion Week, which led to Jesus' death and crucifixion. We take time starting today and really do this quite often, but specifically today, to remember his sacrifice. And so today is a day of remembrance, or we could say a day where we stop and behold. Let's turn to Isaiah 42. That's the word Isaiah uses as he is presenting to us this this Savior. And just a few comments to give us some some context about Isaiah, because we're going to do him some injustice by not presenting his entire book this morning. But the theme of Isaiah is God judges the proud but delivers the humble. And thankfully, we're in the part of Isaiah now where the focus is on delivering the humble. The first 39 chapters of the book deal with God judging the proud or the sinful. And now, uh, starting in chapter 40 on, the theme begins to shift to the deliverance for those who respond uh, to, to God. And it's not just that there is deliverance in some kind of an abstract way that, that uh, the people find an escape, but that a deliverer comes to provide deliverance. And God takes the initiative here to reveal a deliverer, to reveal himself as the deliverer and offer deliverance. As a matter of fact, to illustrate this idea of God taking that initiative later in the book of Isaiah, it says in Isaiah 65, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. That's God taking the initiative to reveal himself to us. In other words, the gospel was sent to us. We didn't find it. We didn't discover it. We didn't happen upon it. It was sent to us. God seeks us. You probably have... Your Bibles turn to Isaiah 42, if I haven't already given you the chapter. And if we look now just for a little more context to to give uh, this passage some some justice, I mentioned that we're we're in the section of Isaiah where we're talking about deliverance. And one of the themes that has shown up through the book of Isaiah is that God wants to talk to us. He invites conversation. You might remember from the early parts of the book, Isaiah 1, 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. He wants to talk. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Well, that that theme continues, and if you just glance right back over at chapter 41, verse 21, he says, Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. What What is the case here? It's the case for are your idols worth anything? Prove to me your value. Idols, uh, speak up for yourself. And he says in uh, verse 24, Behold, you, idols, are nothing. Then he turns his attention to those who made the idols. Verse 29, Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. So this context here is God's having this conversation about the true God. And he says, behold, idols, you're nothing. Behold, idolaters, you are nothing. And then chapter 42, verse 1, he says, behold, my servant. And so this conversation, God is really now through his prophet Isaiah in the most beautiful, it's his poetry, literally Isaiah is writing in a poetic style here, in poetry, God is now going to begin to reveal his servant, to us. And so this morning, starting on this Palm Sunday, we're going to stop and we want to behold his servant. 
we want to enter into this conversation that God wants to have with us where he is going to introduce us to his servant. And uh, one more time to just shortchange Isaiah, I'm sorry, but the servant is Jesus. I don't have the time to prove all that. <laughs> let's, just, let's just trust that that's going to unfold as we go this morning. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would help us this morning to do exactly what you've invited us to do, to behold your servant. That's worth our time, the 30, 40 minutes we're together here. It's worth much more than that. And I pray, that God, that as we do that, that you would change us, that you would grip our hearts, and that you would cause us to behold anew and fresh the wonderful servant who is Jesus Christ. We ask for strength and grace in his name. Amen. We're going to look at four songs this morning. I mentioned this is poetry, and throughout uh, these chapters where Isaiah is writing in poetry, he's actually going to write four songs. We call these the servant songs, and so we're going to look at all four of those, and so the sermon has four points. The first one is Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 9, and we're just going to pick out a few things from these songs. So again, uh, we're doing a lot of disservice to Isaiah, this wonderful prophet, this morning. This first song introduces the servant of the Lord and says that he faithfully shows mercy to the helpless. He faithfully shows mercy to the helpless. He is a merciful servant, as Isaiah is going to reveal. This idea of mercy means pity or compassion. When we think about it in a biblical or a theological sense, it means forgiveness, It means withholding of punishment. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This is is mercy. Pity, which then results in our forgiveness. It said he's a merciful servant. This servant, Jesus Christ, to him, Nothing is truly useless. The helpless are of special concern to him. We see this in verse 3. It says, he will not cry aloud. Uh, Verse 3, I'm sorry. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. This is, from a literary standpoint, what we know as a, a, a litote. I didn't know this until this week. A litote. It is an understatement in which an affirmative is expressed with negatives. We use this all the time in our, in our language. For instance, that's not half bad to mean that's really good. Or uh, I wouldn't say no to that, to say I'm going to say yes, I want that. This is one of those things. In other words, this servant's mission is so without precedence, we really can't talk about it as well, in the positive. We can't even quite describe how merciful he is. All we can do is say what he will not do. And here's what he will not do. It says, he will not break a bruised reed. Reeds were used to make flutes, measuring rods, pens, and other things. When a craftsman was going about the business of making one of these things and going through the reeds that he had gathered, if he came across one that was bruised, he would break it and discard it and go on to another one. That's because reeds were literally uh, less than a dime a dozen. They were so cheap. They were everywhere. Someone has said they were growing by the millions in every marsh and riverside. In other words, why take any time to deal with a reed that is not perfect? You just toss it and go to the next one. This is a metaphor for people. When Jesus finds people who are imperfect, he doesn't discard them. He doesn't break them and throw them to the side. One commentator said, every person is a bruised reed. And every Christian is a bruised reed that Jesus has not discarded but redeemed. We're not in the kingdom because we are perfect. We're in the kingdom because Jesus is pleased to use bruised reeds. A perfect reed, at best, is considered something very fragile. It's the image of weakness and helplessness. 
I don't have reeds growing in my yard or I would have tried to bring one this morning, but you could picture the uselessness or the feeling of this if you've ever tried to measure something at some distance by yourself. And so you start to extend the measuring tape, and what happens when it gets about four feet out away from you? It breaks. And it's at that point, what? It's useless. It's not going to measure anything. So I say, Kara, come here. I need you. I need you to hold the other end. It's the same way with this, this reed. It has no purpose if it's, if it's bruised. And even at best, it's, it's considered something that is very weak. Some of you may be familiar with Chuck Colson. He was President Nixon's kneecapper. That's how they refer to him, how he saw himself. He went to prison after pleading guilty for a Watergate-related crime, and in prison he found Christ. After he was released from prison, he started a prison ministry called Prison Fellowship. Its logo is a bent reed. Someone said it reflected, this is on their website, it reflected Colson's belief that no one, not the most hardened criminal nor the most egotistical Washingtonian, was beyond hope. It also says that a faintly burning wick he will not quench. The lamps of ancient Israelites used wicks made of flax. That was a fibrous plant. And as long as that wick was was functioning properly, it put off light, and that's what they needed. But if that uh, wick or that, um, that plant wasn't functioning properly or it had gotten so low that all it could do is put off a uh, smoke, it's a nuisance for two reasons. Number one is it's not producing any light. And number two, it's actually now giving off a little bit of a foul odor because it has gotten to that point. So what you would normally do is you would just quench it and you would replace it. You wouldn't take the time to try to work with what's there. It's not, it's not worth your time. So for this bruised reed, this wick, it took time, it was trouble, it took patience to to work with what was there, to make anything useful out of a bruised reed or a smoking wick. This applies to us in several ways, but one is that we look at people around us and we view those that are down and out in our society, in our world, as not worth the trouble, not worth the time. We don't see how anything can be uh, made of any good use from those. But let's just hold on just a moment and realize that we are all the down and out, that we are all in this passage the bruised reeds and the faintly burning wicks. We have been brought low by our circumstances, by our sin. Turn to Matthew 11. Let's see how this was illustrated by our Lord Jesus. And this is a four-part series in one morning, so I'm just going to move on and, and uh, please catch up. Matthew 11, verse uh, 28. Have you ever heard these words? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What, what does that mean, all who labor and are heavy laden? That means you are a bruised reed or a faintly burning wick. You've been, you've been brought low. You're discouraged by, by sin, by life, by circumstances, by weariness, by, by your own shortcomings. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. This is that servant who does not break the bruised reed, does not quench the, the smoking wick. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew uh, continues in chapter 12. Won't go through all of this, but the, the, uh, the passage continues where Jesus was with his disciples on a Sabbath, so on a Saturday, and his disciples were hungry, and they plucked grain and began to eat it. The Pharisees didn't like this because this was breaking, uh, this was technically, as they saw it, breaking the law. 
And so they confronted Jesus about this. And he responded in verse 5, Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? It sounds like to me he's defending them for what appears that they have broken the law. He, he is dealing with a bruised reed. I tell you, verse 6, something greater than the temple is here, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Well, then Jesus went and entered the synagogue, verse 9, and, and there was a man with a withered hand, and the uh, Pharisees wanted to catch him again and said, is it lawful to heal this man on the Sabbath? They wanted to accuse him. And so Jesus uh, debates with them, and he ends up in verse 13, healing the man. And it is restored, it says, healthy like the other, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, here we go, aware of this, their response, and how they did not like the fact that he was helping the helpless. He withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was, fulfill, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen. Drop down to verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. He is a merciful servant. Jesus illustrated this by helping those who were in need. Even if it offended, rubbed the Pharisees the wrong way, that was not his purpose. That was not his concern. It was the one who was weak, who was helpless, and he helped them. Luke 18, 13 how about this character? It says the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is a bruised reed, a tax collector. That's somebody that the Jews would have just as well broken half and thrown to the side. That's a, that's a, a, a smoldering wick, one that the Jews would have rather just snuffed out. That tax collector. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. With this servant, you, found, you, you will find him to be merciful. He's also a faithful servant back in Isaiah 42. He's a faithful servant. Verse 2 says, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. This idea of cry aloud suggests that which startles. And it says he will not lift up his voice. This means to raise one's voice. Indicates an attempt to dominate to shout others down. And it says, or he will not make it heard in the street. This suggests self-advertisement. In other words, Jesus, this servant, is not argumentative. Jesus did debate with Pharisees, and they oftentimes provoked him, but he never let himself get heated. He never raised his voice. He never screamed, he never shouted, he never yelled at him. This is, a, this is a man who never once raised his voice, lost control. No one ever caught him in the streets arguing. All of these things together emphasize a quiet, unaggressive, unthreatening servant. He's faithful. It says in verse 3, he will faithfully bring, at the end of the verse, he will faithfully bring forth justice. Verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. This servant, in other words, is going to face similar pressures that made others burn low. We look at that wick, a faintly burning wick. But he does not burn low. These are, these are the same words in Hebrew where it says, he will not grow faint. Others were a faintly burning wick, but he will not grow faint. 
It calls others to be bruised or we could say crushed like that bruised reed, but he does not bruise, meaning he does not take that hurt. It does not bring him down. This doesn't say that he won't experience suffering and pressure and blows, but it will not deter him. He will faithfully execute his mission. He has the inner resources not to grow faint, and he can withstand the outward blows that would have brought others down. He is a faithful servant. He will continue to fulfill his mission. The second song, the second song in Isaiah 49, this is verses 1 to 13, the second song builds on this. And as these songs progress, the the biography of the servant of Jesus begins to unfold more and more clearly. Now we see something about his mission. He will be humbled and rejected while on a rescue mission. He will be humbled and rejected while on a rescue mission. How is he humbled? 49 verse 4 He'll be humbled by a lack of progress. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. John 1, uh, John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 9 and 11 says, He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. This servant who has been sharpened, who has been polished by God, those are the verses that we skipped over. He doesn't receive a warm reception. And the servant is here discouraged because he's put forth effort. He has labored. It says he's spent my strength and and nothing's been achieved. It's, It's vain, literally for nothing. But the next thought that he says is that it is for the Lord to decide what is due. Yet surely my right, my due, my my pay is with the Lord. One commentator said that Isaiah here foresaw a servant with a real human nature. He was tested like we are and proving himself to be the true author and perfecter of the way of faith, a real personal personal faith that can still say, my God, when nothing any longer seems worthwhile. And that is what this servant says in verse 4. He says, yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. This is true faith. He is, according to Hebrews 12, to the founder and perfecter of our faith. And we continue to follow in that path to call him my God, even though we are discouraged, even though circumstances around us do not look like we're making any progress. So he's humbled, but he's also rejected. Look at verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation. He is despised. This is demeaning of His dignity, and He is abhorred. He is held in popular repugnance. Everybody looks on Him this way is what it's referring to. And this is by the nation. It's not by one person. It's not by a group. You can't blame just the Pharisees here. You can't blame the Sanhedrin. What this is prophesying is that everybody turns on him. It starts with the representative of the nation. Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? This is in John 19, 10. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? The nation is beginning to turn on him. So Pilate then puts him to the people to decide between Jesus and Barabbas. It says in Matthew 27, the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The governor again said, which one of these do you want me to release? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do to Jesus who is called Christ? Let him be crucified. And he said, what evil has he done? They didn't answer. They just continued crying. Let him be crucified. This is him being deeply despised and abhorred by the nation. Yet he's on a mission. He's on a mission to rescue, 
turn back to verse 5, and, and we can do this if you're wondering if I'm, if I'm really you know, messing Isaiah up. He's writing, it's his poetry. Poetry's got odd flows sometimes. So this actually might be the, the logical flow of thought that we're following back and forth. Back to, back to um, verse 5. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him. Are you hearing language of a rescue here? And that Israel might be gathered to him. He had been created, this servant, and fashioned for effectiveness. The mission brought discouragement that we read in verse 4, where he says, I've labored in vain, I've spent my strength for nothing but vanity. But now the servant is reassured. Do you hear that? That reassurance? The Lord says to him, I formed you from the womb to be my servant to bring Jacob back, to gather Israel back. And so this this servant is being encouraged by the Lord in the mission that he's given to be successful. And this encouragement is is so thorough and so effective. Verse 6, the narrative changes not to, you can do it, to this. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant. What he's saying is, this mission now is, is so little for you as my servant. The Lord expands his mission, not just bring back Jacob and bring back Israel. But do you see how the mission is expanded in verse 6? You see the end of it? It says, you're my servant. You're going to be successful. Matter of fact, I'll expand it to, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Paul quoted this in Antioch of Pisidia when he was taking the gospel to the Gentiles to to prove that God's word is being fulfilled, that Jesus was going to be a light to the world. That mission that had discouraged the servant, which, which shows us that he is a true perfecter and founder of the faith, that he, as a man, also suffered discouragement. But then that quickly changed when he spent time with the Father in intimacy to where then it turns to not only am I now uh, sure that I can do this, it's, it's really too small for me. I can handle this to now the, the mission is expanded to the whole world. His salvation is going to reach everyone. And this thought is not that the servant will just get the message out, right? that, that he will communicate salvation to everyone. The thought here is that this servant is the salvation. He's not just going to carry light, but that he is light to the nations. He is the light that the world needs. This is more than a man can do. This is more than a prophet can do. This is Isaiah beginning to unveil slowly through these songs, the servant. And now we see that the servant, though though humble and merciful, even rejected, he's on a mission. And he's given a mission that at the beginning of it seems unbelievably difficult But now God is expanding that mission to include the entire world. Isaiah continues in the third song, chapter 50, verse 4 to 11. Now this servant, continuing on this theme of this mission, the servant is faithful to his mission in the face of abuse. Not just rejection. Not just pressure and difficulty, but, but abuse. He is an abused servant. Look at verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. 
I told you earlier, we'll skip over who the servant is. There's a lot of interesting study you can do on who that servant is. And, and as these songs develop, you can start by thinking, is the servant Israel as a nation? At this point, it's shifting very clearly. This is no longer Israel as a nation. This, this is a person who experienced real abuse. There's a man who actually felt this abuse. Can you hear it in those words? I gave my back to those who strike, and I gave my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. This suffering is not merited. It's not warranted, but it is accepted. The servant says, I gave my back, meaning he accepted this abuse. From this teaching about this servant, from Isaiah. Isaiah is basically saying when you, in this song, when you see this threefold suffering take place, so, so this is prophecy. This is happening 700 years before Jesus is born. This is being spoken. This is being written. So when you see these three things happen to a person, that's my servant. The threefold suffering is this. Number one, a judicial act of flogging. What do we mean by judicial act of a flogging, meaning that it is, it is from the, the state, it is from the court, it has been decided that that is your punishment. Matthew 27, 26, then he released for them Barabbas, Pilate did, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. That's him experiencing the judicial act of scourging or of flogging. This was a Roman judicial penalty consisted of severe beating, and we, you've probably heard of this being described before with a multi-lashed whip containing embedded pieces of bone and metal. When you see that, combined with two more, now, now that is, that's happened before. Rome has sentenced people before to flogging or scourging. But Isaiah is going to say when you see a judicial act of, of Flogging, combined with unwarranted torture. Continue in Matthew 27, verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. Things are changing now. The court didn't order this. The court ordered the flogging. That was severe enough. But now the soldiers are going to have some fun. So they get the whole battalion together. Come on in, guys. And they stripped him and put on a scarlet robe and twisting together a crown of thorns, they they put it on his head. So where you see a judicial act of flogging and you see unwarranted torture combined with the third, personal humiliation. Isaiah saying, that's my servant. Continuing in Matthew 27, and they put a reed in his hand. We already talked about a reed somewhat. It's a plant. It'd be the, the equivalent of, of, a, of a child going to, going to war saying, this is my sword holding, uh, holding the, the inside of wrapping paper, the little cardboard, saying, I'm going to do some damage here. It's not going to hold up. A reed, yes, it, it, it's a staff of sorts, but you can't lean on it. Matter of fact, uh, Egypt was called in the Old Testament, you are a reed, meaning you're going to fall down. As soon as anybody leans on you, you're untrustworthy. And so they gave Jesus a reed and, and they put it in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, hell, king of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head with it. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. This is that personal humiliation. But this is, this is in a sense behind closed doors. Jesus is now going to leave and walk through the streets with the evidence of this flogging and this torture. And when he makes it to the cross, the soldiers have him nailed on the cross. It says, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. How did they get his garments? Well, they stripped him in front of everyone. It's humiliating. 
that they took off his clothes. And it says, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you would have destroyed the temple and rebuilt it in three days. Save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. So the chief priest and the scribes and elders, they mocked him saying he saved others. He can't save himself. He's experiencing public, personal humiliation. When you find that in one person, you're looking at God's suffering servant. He's an abused servant. But he's faithful. Continue in chapter 50, verse 7 now. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. I set my face like a flint. Luke 9.51 says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, for him to die, be buried, be raised, and taken up, it says he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Matthew 20, verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 and he, and he said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he'll be raised on the third day. Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem to, to, to attend a concert or to shop at Costco. Jesus went to Jerusalem on purpose. He set his face like a flint. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem to be arrested, to be condemned, to be abused, to be crucified. He is a faithful servant, knowing that he would face those things. He says, I've set my face like a flint. I know I shall not be put to shame. So this mission begins to be further described that along that mission, he will face extreme abuse. The fourth servant song in Isaiah is found in Isaiah 52. Starts in Isaiah 52, verse 13, all the way to chapter 53, 12. the details become much more clear about his abuse. Chapter 53, 3 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men, men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Think of this designation. A man of, that's, 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 his, that's his legacy, that's, that's, his, that's what he's known for, a man of this. There's one statement that, that identifies him. Of all the things about Jesus, the thing that sets him apart, that is peculiar, is his sorrows. Meaning he will face sorrow unlike anyone else. That's a man of sorrow. Not Job, who lost his, nearly his entire family, but all of his possessions. We would think, I've never faced sorrow like Job, but Jesus is a man of sorrows. What he faces, unlike anything anyone has ever faced before. How great were his sorrows. Go back to chapter 52, verse 14. It says, His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. He was disfigured. He was beaten to a point that he was unrecognizable. He was abused. I didn't tell you what this, what this uh, fourth song reveals to us, but this is it. Is that through humiliation, rejection, abuse, and death, he accomplished his mission. 
It's through this humiliation, this rejection, this abuse, and death that he accomplishes his mission. He was continuously acquainted with grief. But he's not just an abused servant. He is, thankfully, a substitute servant. Look at verses 4 to 6. And let me give you a little more context. Something happens in, in, in these songs that we haven't seen yet. Everything so far has been in the second or third person, but the first person shows up for the first time in, chat, in verse 2. He had no form or majesty in the middle of that verse. He had no form or majesty that we should look on him and no beauty that we should desire him. End of verse 3, and we esteemed him not. Verse 4 brings in that he is our substitute servant. Surely he has borne our griefs. That hasn't shown up yet. It's been a little bit distant. It's been a little bit abstract. But now Isaiah says, this is our griefs that he's bearing. These are our sorrows that he's carrying. Verse 5, it's our transgressions that brought his wounds. So when he was condemned by the Romans, it was not because he was worthy of condemnation, it's because we were worthy of condemnation, because we had sinned, we had transgressed, we had broken the laws, not just of a state, not just of Rome, but of God. And with his stripes, we are healed. This shift to the first person pronouns is powerful. It introduces Jesus as our goel in the Hebrew. Jesus as our kinsman, redeemer, our goel. If an inheritance had been lost, it was the right of the next of kin to redeem it, to bring it back for someone. Think about Ruth and Boaz. Jesus exercised here his legal right, seeing us sold into bondage, seeing our inheritance taken from us. He came forward. He initiated this, voluntarily came forward to redeem us and to restore our lost inheritance. There could be no other substitute for us but a man. Philippians 2, 7, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This was critical. This was absolutely necessary that Jesus become a man in order to be our substitute. Man had transgressed and man must be punished. God made him this servant Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, and by his wounds we have been healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. We cannot save ourselves. We need a substitute to take our place. Verses 11 and 12 of chapter 53, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I'll divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with sinners, with transgressors, yet He bore the sin of many. He's a substitute servant, and he is a sacrificial servant. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. This is introducing a new image, and that is that of of a sacrifice. Not just a substitute, but a sacrifice. You can substitute for good things. I can take your shift at work and get paid that you're not getting paid. But he was our substitute as a sacrifice, meaning he gave up something. He gave up everything. He suffered everything. 
It says, like a sheep, verse 7, that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, and for his generation was considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. This is like that innocent lamb on the day of atonement who uh, takes on the sins of the nation and then is, is banished, is sent away. So Jesus is cut off from everyone. He's rejected by everyone. And he is sent out. He is sent away. He is our sacrificial servant. He is innocent as that lamb. And verse 9 says, They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. His character was impeccable. He did not deserve this sorrow, this punishment, this grief. But God put forth his only son as a sacrifice. Not just a sacrifice, as your substitute sacrifice. So that you did not have to lay down your life for your sin. God made that choice, verse 10 says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He is our sacrificial substitute offering. The New Testament quotes the book of Isaiah more than any other book in the Old Testament. Most of those are from this last song that we just read, identifying clearly that this servant is Jesus Christ. So what is the big deal here? Where the big deal is this. We started with those words, behold my servant. Take some time to look at him, to behold him. On Palm Sunday, that's exactly what was happening. Jesus could have come into Jerusalem any number of ways, but he came in in such a way it was visible. There could have been upwards of two million people in Jerusalem there getting ready for Passover. And so uh, the, the city was teeming with people, and Jesus entered in in such a public way where he could be seen, and, and he was fulfilling this prophecy. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. He is coming. God sent him to you. He takes the initiative to send this servant as a rescuer, as your sacrificial sacrifice. It says in Isaiah 65, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. Jesus showed up on the scene when we were prideful. The theme of Isaiah is God uh, humbles uh, the, uh, the prideful or destroys the, I forget what I said earlier. God, uh, we'll say, destroys the prideful but he delivers the humble. When we were prideful, when we were blind, and we were rebellious to him, God sent forth his son. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I. Here am I, Jesus is saying. I'm here to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good. So here's the big deal. Don't miss Jesus, your Savior. He says, here am I. Jesus Christ, as God's servant, is your humble, merciful, faithful, yet rejected, abused, sacrificial, substitute, rescuer. He is your only hope for salvation. J.C. Ryle, the English pastor, prayed this. How beautiful are your wounds, Lord Jesus. How amazing your grace to those who attacked you. You were truly a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. By your stripes, my soul is healed, and through your death, my sins are forgiven. Your suffering has set me free. Amen. Let's pray. God, we confess this morning that we do not deserve a rescue. We admit this morning that we are sinful, that we are full of sin. We deserve 
the grief, the crushing, the chastisement, the abandonment, the rejection because of our sin. Yet I thank you that you are a merciful God. You take pity on us and you bring forgiveness to us through your servant, through your suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that we would not miss him. I'm gonna give you just a moment to respond to him this morning. And there's two ways. If he is not your substitute this morning, if you have never turned and, and, and traded places with Jesus, given him your sin and, and taken his righteousness, believed, repented of your sin, and believed on him for your salvation, if you've never grasped him, if you've never reached out to him for salvation, I pray this morning that you would do that right now, that you would call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do that, you'll be saved. Believer, if, if he is your, your rescuer, your substitute, take this time to just stop and behold this servant. He, he's your servant as well. He served you. How nice it is to have anyone do anything for us. It's so unusual. Normally you have to be a person of status or you have to have lots of money to have anyone do anything for you. Yet as helpless, bruised reeds and smoking wicks, Jesus is your servant. He laid down everything to serve you. Take this time to behold him. We're going to sing in a moment when I survey the wondrous cross. That's what we're doing. We're, we're beholding, we're surveying the wondrous cross. Let that song wash over you and drive you to the point of relinquishing all pride of all sin. Confess that to him this morning and lean on him as your Savior. God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We're so undeserving of his sacrifice, but we thank you that we can marvel in it and we can benefit from it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.